Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello again, Perpetual Chess listeners. Good to speak to you guys. So I'll introduce our guest in a second, but first, for those who didn't hear my interview with GM Pascal Charbonneau last week, you should check it out. But one thing I wanted to mention is I've got a survey on the website, perpetualchesspod.com. It's an anonymous survey, another thing that I forgot to mention last week. So I don't I don't care who you are. I just want to know how to make the podcast better, a little bit more information about your chess consumption habits and stuff like that, your rating, stuff like that, that will let me know exactly who my audience is because I know some of you and have gotten to know some of you, but not all of you. So please just do me that favor and fill out that survey. It'll take five minutes and it will help me a lot. I've gotten some positive feedback, some negative feedback, and like any chess player, I'm obsessing about the negative feedback, but keep it coming. I, that's what I want to hear. So with that out of the way, let's get to this week's guest. So I'm, I'm really excited for this week's guest. Uh, friends of mine speak very, very highly of him. And of course, he's a grandmaster, former Iranian champion, champion of the land of the sky open, chess writer, Elshan Mor- Moradiabadi. How did I do on your name, Elshan? I'm sorry. You did fantastic. Okay, hey, good. Man. And thanks for joining us. How are you today? Doing good. How are you? I'm... Uh, life is good here in Durham. Uh, it's uh, cold. I think it's close to a uh, freezing degree, but uh, it's very sunny. So it's a nice combination. We had, this, we had a nice walk today with Sabina out there. It was nice. A bit cold, but nice. Yes, I think most listeners will know that Elshan is engaged to former perpetual chess guest, as is not her primary claim to fame. Her primary claim to fame is U.S. women's champion uh, Sabina Foyzer, who was a popular and very graceful guest. So you guys should check out that interview as well. And since that interview, uh, towards the end of it, Sabina mentioned that you guys were thinking about relocating. You were finishing up school and lo and behold, you guys are in Durham, North Carolina. So Elshin, how'd you, how'd you end up there? Well, I have a very good friend here, uh, Walter High, who organizes the very organizes a very good tournament, uh, US Masters, which is growing since 2012. And uh, <clears throat> I've been almost... Uh, Engaged with each uh, edition of the tournament, well, except for two, for two of them. But and uh, so now it's like for me, it's like family. Like he, his family, uh, his son plays chess also. David. Uh, so I'm not close to people I, I care for, and they care for me. And he helped me also with moving to East Coast. We were always thinking with Sabina to move to the East Coast, access to European chess scenes, and easier to travel, more tournaments here. So. <clears throat> Um, all these factors, uh, we consider this place, and so far we're, we're happy. Glad to hear it. Yeah, I know that Texas had, had its good things, but wasn't perfect, so I'm glad to hear that you guys are happy, and you've been busy playing. Uh, I, I like to, to check out not just the international tournaments, which a lot of us follow, and by the way, thank you for taking the time. We're, we're recording here at a banner time for chess watching with the Pro Chess League going on and Gibraltar mm-hmm. in the penultimate round, so... Uh, we're missing some action right now, but you yourself yeah. uh, are playing in a lot of Bill Goitschberg's tournaments, and you just won the Land of the Sky tournament. And sad to report, you beat previous perpetual chess guest and uh, favorite of the online chess community, Uncle Yermo, Alex Yermolinsky. So that's quite an achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. It was a very, yes, uh, Yermo was, it was a very interesting game, and uh, he just... Uh, I, I he gave up some advantage early in the game, but he's very resourceful, the Yermo, and that's why he was and is always going to be a he's always going to be a great player. Uh, so in uh, in his time pressure, I kind of uh, uh, got stuck with his uh, some, with some tactics, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't clear at all. But okay, he was in time pressure, and he was the one who had to find the accurate moves and. Uh, luckily, toward the time control, I I got the winning position, and then he resigned. But uh, we we analyzed the game very nicely, and after that, I learned a lot from him. So, at uh, he's a very he's a very interesting character, and uh, very knowledgeable and resourceful player. So it was an honor playing against him, and it's a great feeling to beat him, of course. 
Yeah, I bet. Because he's so public, because he does a lot of uh, online announcing, and because I'm a big fan of his book, The Road to Chess Improvement, even though he's not like... I've talked to a lot of guests who've beaten super strong players, obviously, with having had guests like Nakamura and Svidler and, and last last week, Pascal, who beat Anand. Um, mm-hmm. So even though I've had lots of guests who are super strong players and who have beaten world-class players, something about Yermo being uh, someone who grew up in the United States and watched him win every tournament in the 1990s, beating him to me seems especially unfathomable. So <laughs> congratulations, and I hope you're Thank cherishing you. the victory. I do, I do. Uh, it was my first win for the year. Uh, before that, we were in Europe with Sabina because we were... Uh, she was organizing her the first edition of uh, Christina Fosher, her mom's memorial tournament, rapid and the place in their hometown city in Romania, Timisoara. So I play, we were there for about we spent about a month in Europe visiting uh, my family and her family, and uh, those who know about Sabina, of course, uh, she won the US Championship two months after her mom passed away, and her mom was also an international master, a very strong player. So I played the Rapid and Blitz tournament there. She was engaged with the tournament, and they had 10 grandmasters, including me, playing the tournament. So it was my first win in the U.S. and my first classical win against the GM, against Yermo here in London, Sky. So it was a good feeling altogether. It seems that January was a good month for me. Awesome. Good to hear. And hopefully February, we're recording this on January 31st. So hopefully February will be more of the same. So you've been quite busy, Elshan, playing. Uh, how do you decide which tournaments to go to? Well, somehow, uh, uh, toward the kind of end of uh, August, I figured that I, I'm doing very well in Grand Prix standing. And uh, then I decided to play as much as I can, try to win the Grand Prix, which I did last year. And uh, uh, I was choosing the ones with the highest Grand Prix and the, and the most, uh, and, and, and I mean, I can't say also the distance, how close they are to where we live. So that was the, that's how I chose my tournament. So highest number of Grand Prix points and uh, uh, how close they are to where, where do we live. That's how I chose my tournaments last year. This year, we think more about the quality with Sabina playing stronger tournaments. We'll play in Iceland, uh, Reykjavik Fisher Memorial and the Reykjavik Open, which is a very strong tournament. And we, have, we are considering to play in uh, Philadelphia Open. When is that? April? It's end of March. It's uh, like t- t- uh, it finishes two weeks before U.S. Championship. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. nothing, nothing immediately imminent. But then you'll you'll start rounding into form. And is do you know yet if Sabina will be playing in the U.S. Championship again? Oh yes, she signed her contract, and uh, I mean it's it's a little bit of pressure playing as the defending champion, but uh, it's also. Nice to play the tournament. It's the best tournament of the year for players like Sabina who wants to who want to shine and show and prove themselves. So yeah, she's going to play there. And you get the to be, you get to be her second, right? Yeah, well that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's I'm, difficult to be a second and fiance, but uh, it's definitely good to be a second of US women's champion. Yes, exactly. I, I'm my wife's second, but not in chess, just everything else. Uh, just provide the support that she needs <laughs> in whatever she needs. Oh, I think we, I think that's I should I should ask you some some about being a second in life. So I think I'm sure you have a lot of experience. You, I, I can learn a lot from you. Yeah. So do you guys have a wedding planned yet? Uh, unfortunately, not yet because you know her family in Romania, mine Iranians, and my parents are living in Iran. My sister lives in Vienna, Austria. So, and you know she has tradition. I have some tradition. I'm really not following any religion. So I really, but we have traditions, Persian traditions. Mm-hmm. So to make it all happen, uh, we're still we talk about it a lot, <laughs> but uh, to plan to finalize a plan, we still we have a very very tight schedule. You know, as I mentioned to you, tournaments here, there, uh, lessons we give, and the uh, camps we might teach, and other things like working on writing a book or starting. Uh, some other activities for girls, but specifically Sabina thinks about think about it a lot. So it puts enough on, on our table that when we think about it, it's just hard to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and plan it. Makes but it's sense. of course, but it's of course we ha- it has to happen soon. <laughs> yes, of course. So we have we've been engaged for too long, three years already. Not three years already. This summer going to be three years. So 
we should we should get it done soon. What every every time something comes up, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, as long as your you know your commitment to each other is strong, you'll figure out the details sooner or later. But but Elshan, I can't let you tease this book without asking you about it. So, are you guys working on a book jointly or independently? Uh, what's the story with it? Uh, I, I'm working independently. It's a, it's a personal project. I don't have a uh, I don't have a deadline or I don't have a, a publisher. But I'm working on it. I don't want to divulge the content of it, if 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 I may. Of course. Uh, but but it's, it won't be about openings. That's all okay. I can say. Chess it related. Be an book. Glad to hear. And I did uh, get a it's chance. A, it's it's a ch- it's going to be a, it's it's a chess book. Of okay. Course. It's right. A, but it's not an opening book. Um, okay. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about it when it comes out. And I did get a chance to watch a couple of your lectures over when you were the visiting grandmaster in St. Louis. And you're a very good presenter, and your your knowledge of chess history is quite evident. So I, I imagine that you'd be able to write a pretty good book. I will turn on that well and thank you for the compliment. I I, I really care about uh, history of chess. I mean, I try to have an academic approach to it. So if it seems it appeals to you, the presentation and the content, I'm glad. I, I welcome all feedbacks like you do, positive and negative, specifically the negative ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be a bitter pill, but yeah, you have to take it. I mean, if you want to get better at something, then then there's only you can only get better through accepting criticism. Absolutely. Um, so how did you get to know? I, I asked Greg Shahadi a similar question, and it, I don't want to pretend like I know nothing about chess history. I, I know a decent amount. Um, but I wish I knew more. And when I watch guys like you just run down the strengths and weaknesses of people like Rubenstein and Lasker from previous generations, uh, how like was there a particular book that helped you learn this, or is it just like from having studied chess your whole life, you you can't even place how you know so much? Well, I studied Rubenstein and Lasker a lot as a kid, and you know I do not I belong to the last generation before computer. So I learned things through books and going over the games of the classical players and the you know famous ones and the ones that they they were impactful through the chess history. Kapolanka Lasker, Lasker, uh, Kapo, uh, sorry, Kapolanka Lasker, Rubinstein, um, Botvinnik. I spent a great deal of time studying Botvinnik, Tall, and of course more contemporary Kasparov, Karpov, and of course Fisher. Uh, I have to confess I haven't spent enough time studying Petrosian and Spassky, which I kind of compensate for it over the years, but not when I was a kid. And uh, and that spending time and reading uh, older books, I think it reveals a lot about their thought process. And uh, I personally was very critical of, well, I wouldn't say critical. I am actually very skeptical about people's opinion. That's not good always. That's bad. Sometimes we have just to trust their opinion. So I would always question that. And I was taking notes that why do you think this way of playing by Winston is so great? And I'll always keep those questions with me. And uh, over the years, when I was solving and I was talking to other people, I developed my own way of thinking about their, their chess. I think that's how I developed my knowledge about classical chess. Okay. And you've been studying it since you were a boy in Iran? You grew up in Tehran, correct? Yes, yes. I lived in Iran. I actually moved to the States 2012. So it's exactly six years and uh, 15 days. And were these books translated into Persian, or were you reading them in English as a kid? Uh, most of them, were, most of them were translated from Russian to Persian because uh, before the revolution in Iran, there was a, a famous Armenian uh, translator who was also an author himself, and he translated a lot of a lot of good books into Persian. Not only chess books, a lot of classical Russian books, and. Uh, he somehow had access to a lot of these chess books and he translated them into Persian. So I would read them, books published in the 1970s, I would read them in 1990s. So uh, my, my dad would buy them in uh, second-hand bookstores and I would just read them, or some reprints. That's how, that's how I had access to these books. And because you know, chess was... Because, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Chess was banned in Iran from 1980 to 1988. For eight, nine years, chess was banned. Yeah, that's just an unfathomable fact. So could you yes, give our is. listeners a little bit more backstory about how that came about? Well, I, I got a chance to talk to a person who was involved actively in chess early uh, in early 80s and right just right after the revolution. 
we had a nice walk, I think it was in London, 2013, and he told me this story. So there was a series of events. One thing was that chess federation location. I'm not sure these are, uh, these are all the things that people have told me, so I haven't double-checked these facts or double-checked these things. So these are not facts. These are things people have told me, and there is nothing written about it. So I just am telling the story of people who were living at that time and they were in, actively involved in chess. So I don't take it as granted, but this is what I know. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they said that the Chess Federation was located near the Bridge Federation. You know, yeah, Bridge was also another game that was very popular in Iran at the time. The card game, Bridge. Yes. And, and uh, well, because it was considered a Western game and, and a source to gambling, and gambling is kind of, I don't know, forbidden or haram, whatever they call it in Islam, so once they they were shutting down that federation, the chess fell victim of, of the fact that they were both located in the same building. That's one, one story. The other one is that uh, on, a, on, a, on a kind of a holy day, a holy Islamic day, they had some chess uh, event going on on TV, on local TV, and that kind of pissed off the imam of the city, and then it started the, you know, the problem with the, with the, with the chess. So these are the two accounts of the stories I heard. I'm going that with the second chess. one. Uh, pro, I, I, the second one is actually, is it's told by the guy who, who says he was involved with the activity, without knowing that it was a holy day, because he wasn't a religious guy. So, the second, the second story... I've I've heard for, from numerous resources, so I think that was the reason. Whichever was the reason, it's it's sad. Then it is the, once they shut it down, they started to justify it, label chess with the, all the bad things, and it it is they demonized the game, source to gambling, and in ruining the kids, and then it, it was it was gone for eight years. But then, before uh, Khomeini passing passing away, he before he passed the rule that chess is not haram, it's, it's okay to be played as long as uh, people do not bet on the result. That's, that's an, the story. Yeah, yeah. that's it's so, it's so hard to wrap one's head around. I mean, I, I knew that this was true, but still, every time you hear it, it's just like, because 1988 is not that long ago uh, in in the grand scheme of things. To have, I mean, it's one thing, we've had guests where we talk about a lack of support for chess, but to have it outright banned is is hard to imagine. So I imagine that you knew people, you, I guess, were a little bit, let's say you were born around then. So it didn't affect you directly, but I guess you knew some chess aficionados who had to go undercover if they wanted to play chess. Is that true? Yes. Actually, there's a funny story. Some friend of mine told me they had an official Iranian championship uh, between 16 players who were active tournament players before the revolution. And once chess got banned... They were playing. Uh, they would get together in a friend's uh, house who had a big house, and they had they had just eight chess sets. So they, they had there were twenty players, but they just chose the top sixteen because they had only eight chess sets. You couldn't even find a chess set. So <coughs> yes, hard to believe it. And they had eight clocks. So some they played a round robin tournament. So it it, it happened in eight. It's in 1986. So apparently there is one edition of the. And they kept all the handwritings and all the games and everything. Somebody has it, but nobody wants to divulge where, where, where those uh, games are. So, yes, a lot of people had to go under a lot of risk to play chess. That's amazing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that somebody might take a risk playing chess, but yes. Oh, I could. believe it. <laughs> in, 19, in 1980s in Iran, you could risk your, not life, but risk yourself to play chess. That's funny. I mean, it's the forbidden fruit. So for one thing, we know that the reason this podcast exists is because chess players are so passionate about the game that they they want to consume chess content all the time, including when they're in their cars and running and stuff like that. They want to be they want as much exposure as possible. So that's part of the pie. But then the other part, of course, is when something gets banned, when something's taking away, it often makes you want it more. So uh, I can understand that they, that wouldn't deter people. But but one question is, what would the penalty be if they had been caught? Do you know? I wish I could give a concrete answer, but maybe a little bit of jail time. Okay. <laughs> maybe. It wasn't that outrageous, but it's still, I mean, jail time is still outrageous, but some, or maybe some financial fine, I don't know. 
but uh, I cannot be so sure. But it it was it was uh, big enough that people would wouldn't risk playing so much. Makes sense. And then when you were growing up, about a decade later, as you took an interest in chess, what were there chess opportunities? Were there were you able to find kindred spirits to practice and improve and study with, or did you mostly have to travel in order to pursue chess? Well, I was blessed that I was living in Tehran for for the most part of the 1990s. All the resources in Iran were concentrated in the capital. So there are a few chess lessons you could take per per week in in group lessons that I had a chance to go to those. Like you absolutely couldn't find any sort of other trainings in in Iran in the 1990s for for the most part. And uh, most of the tournaments were also taking place in Tehran. So I didn't have to travel much. Uh, and luckily, uh, a chess aficionado who also had tie in the government became the president of the chess federation. So I was the first generation of, of Iranian players, youth, that got to play in the World Youth Championship. So I was right at the turn, turn of events. I was right there when, when things started changing for better. So I was lucky. Yeah, good, good timing. Um, yes. But it's still, I mean, I feel like given given your background, you probably faced – it was probably a little bit harder for you to climb the ranks than someone born certainly in Russia uh, or somewhere else that was a little bit more of a chess hotbed. Oh, absolutely. I, until I was 14, I was unrated. <laughs> That's amazing. I, but I, I, I wasn't exactly unrated, but I was like very low rated. And then in one year when I started playing tournaments and – even when they were reporting results to FIDE, I had like four names, like Moradi Dash Abadi, Moradi Abadi Elsham with A, Moradi Abadi Elsham Moradi without Abadi. I mean, there were like five or six players registered under, under my name. So once they merged them all together, I suddenly, by the end of 2001, I think I was 2,400. But I was like unwritten a year and a half before that. That's incredible. And it wasn't that long before you won the Iranian championship, right? Yes, but uh, if, as as you, as you see, for the most part, I was unrated. <laughs> Amazing. That's that's really hard to imagine, but funny. And did you have tough competition, like when you were the Iranian champion? Yes, when I won the championship, there was a player who was almost the GM, Guy Magami, who was the first Iranian who became GM, and uh, he was twenty five ten FIDE, and there were three twenty four hundred players in the tournament, uh, and. Uh, and number of 2300s. So my performance was when I won with 10 out of 11 was 2715. That was my performance. That's so it was it was a good tournament. Yes, for sure. Uh, and you mentioned I saw in an interview you conducted in the 2014 Olympiad that that you had a chance to work with the grandmaster Sarhan Guliev. Did I pronounce that correctly? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Uh, he came to Iran um let me think a little bit, make sure that I... Okay, I think he came to Iran March 2000. And he worked with me until March 2001. And not only with me, with all the players in the national team, but luckily for me, most players were not interested in working on their chess. They were just interested in playing and playing in tournaments and getting better like that. But I like to work on chess. First of all, I had the school, so I couldn't lift uh, as often as I wanted. And I like to work on chess. I still like. I enjoy doing it. I don't do as much as I have to, and I don't do it as committed as I used to, but I still do it. I still work on chess. Uh, so these friends of mine, other ones in the national team, I was a new member, of course. I was only 14. I was 14, 15, and uh, I was new. The other ones were like in 20s, early 20s. So uh, uh, Sarhan, I had one lesson with him per week. But since the others didn't, the, the others started not showing up for their t- training, I started going to their classes as well. I knew they were not going to show up. And my our home was very close to the federation, so my two hours training per week turned into twelve hours per week. I think that helped a great deal for me to become a chess player. Yes, working twelve hours 12 a week hours. with a grandmaster is a is a good good trick for improving. I would guess. Yeah, in a year I gained two hundred fifty points. That's incredible, and we're not talking about like we're not talking about a thousand to thirteen hundred. This must have been, I mean, you were already so, over two thousand. Twenty four fifty, yeah, twenty two hundred to twenty four fifty. Very impressive. So you must have had a good work ethic, and I imagine that your coach was uh, was good as well. 
he was an incredible coach, a very ethical man, and he did everything uh, he could for me. Uh, I think uh, it just worked out both ways. He, he was enjoying working with me because he liked my work uh, ethic, and uh, and uh, I really liked him. He was inspiring me. So, and when I started working with him, then then I started thinking about because in Iran we had only few international masters at the time, the the ones that were a little bit older than me. So I was only thinking about I am title. After I started working with him, I started thinking about maybe I should just think think about becoming a GM. So it, it had a great deal of effect on my life. Basically, because of him, I became a chess player, like a professional player. Well, I hope uh, I hope that you've had a chance to thank him. And is he still around? I think he's back in Azerbaijan. He's from Azerbaijan. But uh, I've passed to him that uh, um, message, the one I just mentioned, that I owe him my career more for, for the most part. Good. It's always always gratifying, I'm sure, for a teacher to hear something like that. So you mentioned you initially were focused on the IM title. You ended up, of course, becoming a grandmaster. Do you have any standout memories from getting those titles? And how like how how long in between the two did it take you to get the highest title? Well, when I when I finished when I when I started, when I left uh, left Iran, I was uh, almost twenty four fifty. The Federation started not reporting some of the tournaments I won, and some of the tournaments were supposed to be unrated. They reported, so I lost some rating point. Uh, they didn't send me, because you know, when you are before 18, and you might be eligible for mandatory military service, which I didn't go through it, but I was still, it was debatable whether I have to do it or not. Um, you have to have government's permission to release your uh, to release your passport to travel so that year I was 15 national champion I didn't play any international tournament any international tournament so that was a little bit disappointing so my dad thought it's man, there is no future in chess so I focused on get, trying to get into university so I, I quit chess for a year and a half at the peak of my you know strength in a way as a kid like 15 and 24 50 strength so I got to university, I got to the best engineering school in Iran. And uh, in, a, in about a year and a half after that, I was a GM. That's how it all happened. I am and GM, a year and a half altogether. Pretty From impressive. 20, 50. I think I was at the strength, after I worked with Sarkhan, I was probably a very strong player. I just needed to play a lot. I played a lot and I didn't work as much as I used to when I was working with Sarkhan. I think I was probably 2,500 strength after that one year working with Sarkhan. But I just didn't have the chance to play internationally. In fact, my first open tournament in Europe, I played when I was 20. So, so I didn't have a chance. Yeah, I didn't have the chance to play like many international tournaments. So it sounds to me, Alshan, like if you compare yourself to your contemporaries, other people around your age who became grandmasters, I really feel like maybe you have some untapped potential or like, I don't know if you're still, like you mentioned, I mean, of course, you don't have as much time to study as you would, but it seems like you had this gap where you weren't able to study, you didn't have as many resources and you got a bit of, uh, I hate to call, you know, I hate to call learning chess or pursuing chess at nine or 10 a late start, but certainly there are some grandmasters who start earlier. So do you off, do you ever think about how strong you could have been under slightly different circumstances? I think I just hit 2,600. That's the highest ELO I have ever had. I probably should have easily reached 2,670, I think, and be there. But I wasn't professional enough. I didn't have good... Uh, uh, I didn't have people people with experience so I can get use their advice. And I didn't have the same work ethics in my 20s because... Now Federation had resources. They had money to send me to tournaments. I was one of the top players in the country, but I just didn't have the time because I was in school. <laughs> right. So I don't know. Whenever I had the chance to do it, then I was busy with something else. And uh, probably I could, I, I, I mean, I can say also I could be 2,700, but 2,700, a lot of factors are involved when I talk about it. But probably 2,670, 2675. Well, I'm, when I'm talking about in my prime, so at the time I probably would have been in top 15 in the world with 2675. 
Uh, but I was like, I was like, I don't know, like 40, 50 points below Hare Krishna and uh, Kashimov, and they are kind of very contemporary to, to me, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I was like 100 points less than Mamad Yarov. If you see Mamad Yarov not 2800, I probably could have been 2670, right? Yeah. When he was 2550, I was 2450. So he's he's been on an amazing tear. He just keeps getting yeah. better, better and better. Hey, yeah, well, I'm not comparing. He is a genius. He uh, has the work work ethic uh, like consistently and uh, the love for the game. Of course, he's a he's an artist. Uh, that's how I see. He's just similar to Tal. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't see myself in in that category. But I, I think. 100, 150 points less than that was was normal, probably. Yeah, that makes sense. I was I was thinking more not just about like given the circumstances. It's and it's kind of a silly question because it's kind of hard to imagine. But like uh, a situation or a scenario where you grow up with tons of resources, like the same chess talent, and grow up with tons of resources and don't take time off. So not just that you studied harder in your twenties, but that you're um, surrounded by chess with whatever you need from a young age, it seems like maybe you could have achieved uh, more. But but that gets yeah. into the whole question about the nature of talent in chess, which is a rabbit hole that we could explore endlessly. I don't know if you have opinions about the nature of talent versus hard work generally. I think hard work always beats talent. That's what I believe in. I I I think I was a talented person, but once I learned to use my talent, I became a little bit sluggish and more uh, a bit complacent. That's the word, complacent. And using uh, in working hard, and then that's when I started to stagnate. So uh, talent is important, very important, but hard work, not nothing can beat hard work. I read, uh, I read, uh, um, Greg wrote, uh, Greg Shahada wrote a column, I think, a few days ago about achieving things in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, later age, like when you get older, and uh, I, re- I can agree with him. If someone really dedicates their resources, they should be able to do a lot of things. But maybe not as well as they could do in their 20s, but they still can. They should be able to do it. But talent is something that is very um, situation-based. So I have more respect for hard work than talent. Yeah, it's uh, definitely something that every individual has more control over and do you see this in your students i know that you do some chess teaching as well so do you do, I do you... a lot actually okay um yeah well I, most of my kids are talented but they're busy with doing zillions of things and a few of them really have to love for just to do to have the ethics to have the ethics for hard working by by their by themselves and uh it's a lot of them have the potential. I see. I see in them that they can become masters. But okay, I think it's again it comes to the passion and the willingness to. One in that year with Sarah, when I was working on chess, on an Iranian holiday, I spent ten hours working on chess. I wasn't. I wasn't celebrating. I was working on chess. That was more important to me. On April first, it was one of the Iranians uh, again Persian. Uh, the. Uh, Ceremonies, sort of, you know, it's a holiday, it's off day, it's it's a Persian culture. I spent thirteen hours working with him, uh, and he will spend time with me thirteen hours. Wow. And I think because I really, I badly wanted. I don't know if it makes sense grammatically say that. I really wanted it. I wanted it so bad. Well, that's what it takes. <laughs> so. I have few students that they are not as talented as the other ones, but they're working harder and they have the work ethics. They always do their homeworks. I see a better future for them compared to other ones. And it's, I said in a really factly way because the moment I started becoming dependent on my, on my uh, talent, that's, that was the moment I started to stagnant in life. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and I regret that. So I'm trying to change that. To become to become more even hardworking at this age. I'm thirty. I'm turning thirty three soon. So, so what sort uh, of co- what sort of concrete changes have you made? After after I started to rely on my talent. To yeah to to get back from that to. Oh uh, well, I don't take anything as granted anymore. I don't take anything as granted. 
So I, I question everything and I try to be on top of everything I'm doing, at least with regard to chess and my students and uh, some of the other activities I'm more focused at this moment. Yeah, I was impressed that when we scheduled this interview, you had me send it for your calendar. Uh, <laughs> a lot of chess players are not so organized, myself included. So I was impressed. Like, okay, this you know, Alshon's got a calendar. He knows what he's doing when. He he puts it in, and I know he'll be there. I don't have to remind him. So that I think it's paying off, at least in that small way. Well, it's been a year and a half, uh, a little bit longer actually. Yeah, a year and a half I've been doing it, and it's been. It has changed things for better, so I, I'll stick to it. I'm trying to change my habit of waking up earlier, a little bit working out, and gradually. I don't. I I cannot change things overnight. I cannot be as talented as, as I used to be in my twenties. But gradual improvement is always good. I have a, a great deal of respect for gradual improvement and consistency. Yeah, James Altucher, who's uh, sort of a I don't know how to describe him, businessman slash self help guru although i think he hates that term he's been on the podcast but lately he's been saying that you just need to improve one percent a day at something and if you do that over the course of the year uh, i can't even remember the number he said it compounds to but some shockingly huge number just from getting one percent better at a, a day at something i think he's right i i i really like uh, i'm not following his business ideas but the ones that self self-improvement ideas i really I, I like them and i think he's right about that yeah it, it's uh good stuff so the olympiad i'm i'm a big fan of the olympiad i i really enjoy seeing the team tournaments mm -hmm. and it seems like some of the best stories we've had from guests and best stories that i've read come from various players at the olympiad i know you were there in 2014 and i know you played for iran sometimes so when you reflect on times you've gotten to go to the olympiad what are your standout memories well actually it, it may sound funny to you okay 2014 was a good olympiad for me because that that's the year i uh sabine and i we started to date and you know she was playing for the u.s i was in iran i was playing for iran we were both coming back to start uh, new life together in Lubbock, Texas. So that was very uh, intriguing. But the past four Olympias I played for Iran, they were all very tenacious. And was, I felt always lost because we would play these tournaments. It was part of our yearly uh, stipend to play for, for the national team. So we wouldn't get extra extra, uh, extra payment because we would get some perks to, over through the year. So, so you go there, you don't get paid. And, uh, and we, were not, we didn't know what you we were fighting for. We would go every game, play some game, some, somebody randomly wins, somebody randomly loses, and we would just, again, the tournament finishes. If we do better than last time, nothing. If we do worse than last time, again, nothing. So for me, it was a very weird always tournament because we had no goal. I always would like to be a part of a team that has a goal, and we never had a goal. So for me, but, but... For me, it was a great experience seeing all the great players playing playing uh, their games and how they sit and how they play. And that was my only chance to see guys like Anand or uh, Topalo for, I, I mean, at the time, talking about early 2000 uh, and 2000, early 2010, or Magnus or uh, all the big players are playing. So the way they sit, what they eat, what, how do they prepare, how do they, how do they focus. So that was very interesting. Yeah, that's what so that uh, that's was, what appeals most to it about me. So, do you did you have anything you noticed that stood out to you from getting to see them up close? Uh, I see them very relaxed actually during the Olympiad. It seems like a vacation to them. <laughs> they're still very serious, but I think they feel less pressure when they play in the Olympiad, uh, like Kramnik or other ones. I don't know. They seem less stressed. When I see them in the in, in big tournaments or okay world championship and other ones, they seem very stressed and very tense and very focused. They're still very focused, of course, during the Olympic. But they seem like very they are focused in a very nice way. Very, they're happy to be there. Yeah, it seems the, like among the, among the top players, they seem very happy to be there. Yeah, the thing about the Olympiad is there's lots of tournaments where there's lots of strong players. We have trade wise Gibraltar going on right now. Uh, the, all the invitationals get the best players. Of course, the candidates will be amazing. But the Olympiad is the one that gets like basically every player 
in the every strong player in the world with a few exceptions last time under one roof so between that's why so much history takes place there stuff like you meeting your future wife can take place there <laughs> and then of course all the you know the stories about 12 year old judith polgar making her debut and kasparov coming to watch her uh, as she plays like a brilliant combination stuff like that it can happen at any tournament but more chess history has probably taken place at the olympiad than basically anywhere else so that's why i i'm always eager to talk about it with our esteemed guests such as yourself so uh do you have a sense uh um, if you'll be going to the one in 2018 i wish well i can i mean i think with the strength of mine and, and uh, the group of players have joined national team in the u.s i have no chance of joining national team not now or maybe ever in the future but um i if Sabina would make it, and I find the chance to train some uh, other nations' national team, I may go there. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, yeah. I know that as a you know twenty-five something FIDE player, you you wouldn't quite make the cut in the U.S., which I'm I'm you know yes. you, you'd yeah, be of a, course you'd be a great representative. But I'm glad that the U.S. is so strong right now. I was curious more about like if you if you'd be helping Sabina. Or as you say, maybe helping Iran. I don't know how that relationship is, but something like that. I, I don't know if the Iranian team would be interested in my help <laughs> anymore. We, we, uh, we as a, I mean, I'm an, I'm an American, of course, now. But uh, my people have the tendency, I don't know why, that once someone leaves, we just uh, shut the door behind them. Everybody likes just, it's just kind of, we get disconnected. It's like if there was a wire... There was there was a wire like a joint like keeps you connected and then they cut the wire and just throw you in the space. So that's a very common thing among Iranians. I don't know. And uh, now I don't think they would be interested. But maybe some other nations, some other national teams, smaller uh, federations, they may be interested in my service. Yes, if anyone's listening, uh, Elshan just watches <laughs> lectures on YouTube, and I think that they'll they'll realize that you, you could be a great coach and speak speaking of which so you mentioned you've been doing a lot of coaching what is your like what does your work normally entail are you doing one-on-one lessons primarily or lectures i i have a couple of group lessons but mostly it's one-on-one i mean except that those couple of group lessons it's a one-on-one and like 85 percent is online and the rest are face-to-face Okay. And what's your general teaching philosophy? How do you help people improve? I am more focused on middle game and end game, the thinking process, because, you know, I became to, uh, uh, I became a grandmaster with the help of Sarhan and Sarhan, uh, worked a lot with me and helped me in one year to improve, uh, to increase my rating for 250 points, but we didn't work on any opening. I was working on openings on my own. He never worked on openings with me. He taught me to think. He, I became a problem solver. If I have a position in, before me, how I can deal with it. So he, he taught me how to fish, not the fish. He didn't give me the fish. He taught me how to fish. So you try to do the same with your students? Yes. That's my philosophy. And do you have the any thinking process? And yeah. do you have any resources that you find yourself referring to quite frequently? I wouldn't say I use the same resource. I um, buy a lot of books. And I keep their PDFs as well. So, and uh, I keep through a lot of different materials. And nowadays there are so many good books out there. So many. I'm, if you ask me what's my favorite book, I really cannot answer that question. I can give you 20 names. Wow, that's incredible. But, but there are so many good resources out there. And uh, I try to combine them. I generate my own uh, material as well. For example, I, I mean, just this tournament, Gibraltar, is a great source of. Uh, a great source to generate new materials in tactics, in a strategy, in, the, uh, in, in end game, so many good positions. Did any of so, the games in particular catch your eye? I really liked uh, uh, Hikaru's win over Duda from Poland. That was a very interesting game. In uh, It was in um, a Dragon, Sicilian Dragon. Probably Hikaru played a bit on sound, maybe. But uh, the moment uh, he fully equalized and he w- he had the initiative, he didn't give. He completely outclassed the Duda. Was a very interesting game after after the position was kind of equal. Uh, kind of Duda lost his tra- track and couldn't maintain the pressure. Then once 
once uh, once Hikaru was in control, then he didn't give him a second chance. And it was a great game, I think. Yeah, I really like that game. Yeah, as we record this, there's one round to go, and I checked it before before we started recording, and it Aronian, MVL, and Nakamura. And one or two others were going to be tied for first going to the last round. So it's just amazing to me how the cream rises to the top, how even in a tournament like that, you know, some people say these guys are underrated. I mean, sorry, overrated. But you put them in that giant field of players, and lo and behold, we'll be watching some familiar players tangle in the last round. And by the time people hear this, they'll know what happened. Well, you know, no, no, no. They're, they're very strong players. I think overrated. Okay, what do you mean by Overrated. If if you uh, there's a difference between Hikar being in top ten in the world and you attach a number that is twenty seven or twenty seven fifty or twenty seven eighty, I don't care about the number. I know he's in top ten in the world, and he's been there forever. Or Aronian, or uh, MVL, or Anand. So it's not about the number. It's about how good they are, and they are really good. Yeah, you mentioned in one of your lectures that you had a chance to analyze with Geary. Uh, so I wouldn't mind hearing about that, or if you have any other standout experiences uh, like brushes with greatness, uh, or like the strongest we player. Analyze, we analyze blindfold. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh sorry, no, I didn't hear that. So we analyzed with Geary blindfold after we finished uh, our game, and uh, the way he was uh, coming up, we just spent like two, three minutes. But he was just mentioning this line, this line, this, this, and I was like, oh wow, this guy is so much in control. Huh. He sensed the danger and everything, and it was. And this is, we're talking about not about Anish today, who is a great uh, uh, top ten player. He was rising to top ten at the time, so he wasn't exactly there. And already he was like, "Wow, I'm so happy I made a draw against." I thought I was pressing him the whole time, and I was pressing, but I wasn't aware of what's going on really. He knew when he lost control of the game, and he knew when. Well, I mean, I could understand that I I, I was in driving seat, but I didn't know where if I could get more than what I got. But I mean, he thought, okay, here's where I lost the thread. I didn't realize that you can take back with F takes E pump back E6. And it was like, wow, he, he, he is very, very much in control. And also, it, I mean, I really encourage people to watch uh, Hikaru's comment on his games and when he plays online blades. Really deep, really deep. Uh, just, you can learn a lot from them. Yeah. Makes- it's just great. makes a great impression. I also had the chance once I, Discuss one of one of uh, the opening of my game against Robson with uh, Hikaru and he, Nakamura gave me really really good advice and his understanding of the tempo of the, of the momentum of the game the dynamics everything is just and it just comes to them very naturally. Yeah, I was going to say he more than the others. You get the sense that it just comes easily to him. It it he seems almost like an afterthought. Like this, just all this knowledge at his fingertips. Another experience I had, uh, Aronian, during the St. Louis Rapid and Bliss, I was a gym resident there. And okay, they were playing it at night at the chess house. People would get together and they would play some Bliss, talk, you know, buck house. It was, it was a fun time. So I had a chance to sit and uh, he started showing one of his games for half an hour against Yakovenko and the thought process and the depth of it. I was like, wow. Hmm. I, it was it was very eye opening for me, and I and I was really happy that I still can learn. That was a very good feeling. I thought that I'm so dumb that I, I cannot get these guys, but he was explaining and went over a few lines and he expressed his thought process, and I was like, oh, it actually makes sense. I'm, so it was a great feeling, you know. You get lectured by world number two in such a nice way, and he's he's also very eloquent in the way he expresses his ideas. And uh, also, it, all, it still makes sense to me. So it was a good feeling. Yeah, I would love to to be a fly on the wall for something like that. Yep, and it was uh, still no overrated. That's that's just sounds like a joke to me. With all my respect for all the players in their twenty six hundreds and twenty seven and uh, and uh, high twenty five hundreds. No, we I've played twenty five hundreds, twenty six hundreds, and I've played. I haven't played elite player in my life, unfortunately. Okay, I played Giri, Giri once, but that's it. And uh, no, they just the thought process, the feeling for the game is just very different. I, I never felt that the 2600 or 2500 were just pushing, just completely outplaying me. But right. I, I see in their game and uh, in an elite player that they can just, you know, 
blow me off the board and without no without me understanding why things went wrong. Well, I'm glad to hear that chess is the meritocracy that it presents itself to be. It does. Uh, those are those are fewer and farther between. So it sometimes feels like than they used to be in the world, but in chess, if you're the best, you will get recognized. You get where you have to get, yeah. I mean, look at Nakamura. He won everything in the U.S. and he got where he got. He, he won everything in the U.S. He, he, he won everything and then he went to Europe and he started winning everything there too. And that's yeah. how he got there. Same, I played with, uh, I played with uh, Fabiano when he was a little kid, uh, 14, it was almost 2,500, almost a GM. And uh, every day to come to the tournament, he was driving 40 minutes to get there. So he showed up for our game 30 minutes late. I won the game because he was in time pressure. He was slightly better with Black. He outplayed me, but okay, in time pressure, I swindled him. He was a little kid. And yeah, he, he went through the hard, he did it the hard way and he got to the top most deservedly. Yeah. So do you feel like uh, there's a favorite in the candidates coming up? Uh, favorite in the candidates? It's hard to say. No, I think um, everyone has a has a good chance to win the tournament. Equally. Yeah, I, I give a little bit more chance to um, Karyakin, uh, Kramnik, and Fabiano because they came close to win it. Mm-hmm. I mean, Karyakin won the last one, and Kramnik tied for first 2013, and Arunin always been a con- uh, in con- uh, contestant for it to win it. Somehow he he runs short last few rounds, so. But he's, he, he was there. He was close there. Oh, sorry. Did I say Aronian? I said, okay, four names. Aronian and Fabiano. Fabiano was close last time, too. He lost the last game. So these four guys, I think, have a little bit more chances than the other four. So someone like Shaq Marmadiarov peaking at the right time, you think that takes a mild backseat to experience? A little bit, because this is 14 games. If it was like nine games, I would say it's equal. Because Marmadiarov had won... Uh, Tall Memorials, which is a nine-round tournament, super elite tournament. So he's no, he's done it before. You're right, but 14 a bit longer. You have to have more control over your nerves. So I mean, I would love to see him winning. I mean, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, I mean, he's a good friend, and uh, I, I was uh, had a lot of respect for his chess, and he always demolished me actually when we were kids. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of respect uh, for his chess. But I see his chances a bit less. Okay. Well, hopefully he won't hold it against you. <laughs> no, I hope not. Yeah. No, he's a very nice guy. He wouldn't. Nice. Um, okay, question from Chris Wainscott. And I've only got one or two questions left. Uh, so, uh, And I know that you, that you know him personally. He speaks very highly of you and Sabina, by the way. So Chris Thanks. says, the American chess scene has changed significantly over the past few years. What changes do you see in the next three to five years? And working with so many students, I'm guessing you have your, your finger on the pulse 30 to 5 is a short period if you tell uh, I would say 5 years um, I think in 7 years we will have the first Prodigy 2700 in the US 2700 Do you a, have- kid be, a kid less than 17 and I cannot say there are so many good kids out there right. if, I, if I just mention a name that would be just unfair that was going to be my next question of course but I understand go on yeah, so I think in the next five to seven years, we'll have the first 2700 Prodigy. FIDE, yeah. of course. Thanks in no small part. Well, I know Greg doesn't like the teachers to get credit, but the U.S. Chess School is helping, and there's just so many so many great programs out there and so many resources that, that yeah, I'm, yeah, I feel like the three power centers right now, I don't know, you might still need to include Russia, but to me, it's the United States, India, and China I'll just have these rocket ships coming up and it'll be interesting to see where, where all these talented kids end up. Well, it takes three things, uh, a big pool, uh, resources and uh, money. And when I say resources, meaning that the things, the, the measures, the, the tools that will help a kid to become a top player. So uh, all the countries you mentioned, they have a higher population than Russia. And they have nowadays they have the resources and the money. So uh, I don't see why not these three countries would be because I I, I just so go with the simplest statistics. Uh, U.S. population is three times Russia probably a little less than three times, and and of course uh, India and China of course 
just 1.5 billion. Yeah. <laughs> so you expect that statistically, and now resources and the information and and access to the resources is equally distributed around around the world. So it becomes a fair game. It has become a fair game. So then statistically, these three countries should do better than the other ones. Yeah. Because we have a bigger pool. Yeah, and they are. And for those of you who've heard my interview with Ayam Sagar Shah, they're starting to get a lot of support at the government level for Indian chess players. So while you may not think of them as a very rich country, uh, they've got a rich chess scene right now. And it shows in the results that people like Vidit and... Uh, I'm, I feel terrible that I still can't pronounce Praga. Praga, Nada. yeah, his his name. But obviously, uh, investing money pays off <laughs> when it comes to chess, as with everything else. It does, and, and when you have a big pool and great interest and enthusiasm, and you know people participating in the, in, the, in the tournaments. I mean, just consider last year's uh, Super National. Six thousand kids are playing, and that's just one of the many examples. So one of the many pools. So it just tells you that, you know, with this great amount of interest, it should get to next level. Yeah. Well, the thing is that chess is not considered a big thing here compared to China or India. There's more respect in China and in China or India for chess than here in the United States. So that could be a little bit of setback for us. I can see that could be a setback, the respect for the game. But I still th- think that the pool is big enough and the resources are now well allocated and the families, they know what they have to do. And there's, there are so many good coaches out there. So, yeah. And I do think that's changing slowly. Uh, I think if, if we got a world champion, it could change quickly, but otherwise it's just going to change. We being the United States, otherwise it's just going to change slowly, but at, at least the, uh, the ship's heading in the right direction, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can agree that is I, a little bit I was more um, conservative in my predictions but yeah I can I I, 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 I totally agree with, with the direction part yeah. yes so I saw in an interview Alshan with Grandmaster Daniel King that I think you also may have given at the Olympiad where you mentioned that you're an avid reader not just of chess books but books of all kinds so I was curious mm-hmm. uh, obviously you you say you have too many chess books that you love to even name one. Do you have any other book recommendations uh, for me? You mean ch- and- chess, well, chess books I, lo- I love. Uh, all the end game books, Dvoretsky, Kostin Miller, and uh, uh, books by Smyslov and Levenfish. This, this, uh, these are just fantastic end game books. And you just the more you read them, you just realize the fathom, the, the depth of the these books. They have spent these these authors have spent a lot of time writing these books. They are all very very fantastic, and uh, that's for the chess books. You mean the non chess books? If I have recommendations, yes. I'm reading the Black Swans by Nassim Taleb, and I really love it. Yeah, it's an interesting book. Yes, I, I like it. Yeah, he's. Um he's a personality he's one of these guys i read his books and i like them but then if i watch an interview uh he's um he can be a bit arrogant but he had a brilliant insight with with black swan yeah, but what, or, when or, someone or, someone writes a book like this and has his credentials and lives in the united states and comes from the finance world you expect him to be arrogant <laughs> yeah otherwise he cannot be there <laughs> yeah it's it's true it's it's not so it shouldn't be so shocking but yeah, that's a great book. And you mentioned that is Shakespeare is your favorite author. He is, yes. The classics, nice. And, and also, I, I have a, I love uh, all the Sherlock Holmes books by Conan Doyle. I, I read all of them. I like I like Sherlock Holmes, the the detective books by Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle. If I pronounce it correctly, so, yes. Yeah, so yes, or Arthur Conan Doyle. So you're well steeped in the classics in chess as in life, you could say. Uh, well, I'm becoming becoming inspired, huh? Two classics. Yes. Time time for me to, to sit in the museum. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Right, not yet. So you guys mentioned, or you mentioned the big tournaments that you and Sabina have coming up. Do you have anything on a smaller scale? Any of the the local uh, uh, North there is Carolina? A, there, there is there is there is one small tournament in North Carolina, Ron Simpson Memorial, that Walter runs it in March, right after, uh, right, uh, right after. Uh, 
Reykjavik Open. And there is another one in February, uh, George Washington Open. It's a Goichberg tournament in, I think, where exactly it is? Somewhere. We fly to DCA. We fly. It's near Washington DC. Yeah, they're often in Virginia, Northern Virginia. I'm yes. not sure where this one is. Um, okay, and I think this is uh, basically my last question, other than you passing out any sure. contact info. So you mentioned you are working on your chess a little bit, not as much as you would like. So what do you work on right now in order uh, to improve calculation, middle game, in learning new techniques, trying to study a uh, game of the top players like Magnus, uh, Anand, Nakamura. These are these are the guys I understand their chess better than the other top players. And, uh, yeah. Uh, what resources for, like, if you're going to work on your calculation, how would you do that? Well, I put a position that I th- see that they went wrong, and I want to try to figure out how they went wrong. I, I have my own method. I usually do not. I use some books, for example, some of the uh, Jacob Agard's book or the Endgame, Endgame books, or because I need to see the positions I haven't seen before. A lot of time I open a book and I've seen half of the, half of the positions before, and it's just it's not new to me because I already know the answers. That that's the problem. So I have to generate my own material, see positions, and try to analyze them, challenge the computer, the engine. So that's how I work because a lot of time I just open a book and I have seen everything before. Yeah, maybe seventy percent of it. Yeah, that's a good insight, and I've noticed that with players like Greg Shahadi, who I'm friends with, he. Yeah, there are so many if he just opens a random book where he just knows it, knows it because he's been exposed to the pattern. So would you ever take out a chess set and set it up? Like if, if you're intrigued by a game in Gibraltar, do you tend to just pull it up on the screen or do you use an actual chess set? No, I'm, I've been a lazy boy since I was a kid. And that's, that, <laughs> that, 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 that helped me a lot. My dad always was saying, oh, you don't work on chess. But then uh, Sarhan, when, when he was working with me and he was encouraging us not – not to uh, put a chess set and actually read the books, just just try to visualize it. And I think that helped me a lot. So I was a lazy boy that helped me. Th- that way it helped me. So I, c- I can visualize. I can see. Like, I can even play blindfold up to 10 boards, which is not bad. Okay. Gariev is the, is the king. He, he can go up to 50 <laughs> boards or something. But I mean, for me, it's good, you know? Yeah. I, don't, I don't practice or doing it, but I still can do 10 boards. So that's good. That yeah. means that I can calculate. I can visualize. I, I would say so, yeah. I think... Um... T- ten is uh ten is respectable. <laughs> yes, ten is a respectable number. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Cool. So, Elshan, if anyone wants to reach out to you who's listening, what is the best way to track you down? Um, email and my email is my first name dot my last name at gmail. Okay. So that's that the best way. Great. I will include that in the show notes. And and do you have anything else before uh, we go on to our next uh, engagements? Uh, well, uh, first of all. I would like to thank everyone who were listening to this because the more they show interest and enthusiasm for chess, that means that it encourages us guys like me more to be more involved in chess because it becomes more than just a job. It becomes returning to, to the community. It becomes a source of connection to the community. So I really appreciate that. And But for the most part, thank you, Ben, because you make this happen. You put us in touch with the with other chess people so you kind of connect us together so thank you sure that's the goal and people like you and sabina are great ambassadors for chess so glad to give you guys Appreciate a platform okay well thanks alshan uh good My luck in, in iceland and beyond thank you thank you okay. thanks to everyone who supports perpetual chess i spend about five hours a week on each episode and even though i love doing the show it can be hard to find the time Without the financial support of the chess community, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. Special shout out goes to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners, and I have finally updated the list. You guys are Adam Vrancouz, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Chad Hilton, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Bonastasia, Jason Dunbar, Jeffrey Martello, Jen Shahadi, Jennifer Valens, Jen Scream, John Fernandez, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopalakrishnan, Lorraine Dore, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek, Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Victor Vrancouz, Zhao Cheng, Zivko Stoyanov. 
Thanks a lot, guys. I'll catch you guys next week with another episode.